Good evening. Welcome to the User Experience Speaker Series. My name is Chen Zhou. I'm a professor and director of the Graduate Certificate in Design of User Experience at Metropolitan State University. Tonight, we will hear from Dr. Alex Thayer, whose talk is titled, Algorithms, AI, and Art History, Exploring the User Experience of Rational Agents. Dr. Thayer is a user research leader at Google and an affiliate assistant professor in the Human Centered Design and Engineering Department at the University of Washington. Prior to joining Google, Alex was the head of research for Amazon and the chief experience architect for HP Labs. Alex's professional work focuses on explorations of the socio-technical gap and how we make sense of people's habits, practices, and messy lives. His academic work spans topics that include multimodal interaction and education, professional collaboration and research uh, and relationship work, and digital gaming. He has published 10 patents on haptic feedback systems, immersive displays, and wearable technology. On a personal note, Alex and I went to the same PhD program. During the first year, we were both in the digital gaming research group. It's wonderful to have you back, Alex. Um, please join me in welcoming Dr. Thayer. Cool. Uh, Chen Zhou, Professor Zhou, thank you so much for, what a wonderful intro. Uh, it's great to see you again as well. It's been, it's been way too long. Uh, and I'm glad that uh, you've invited me here to speak uh, with you and with your class on this topic. I'm very excited uh, and yeah, have a lot of content to share. Again, thank you for that wonderful intro. Um, one quick question for you. Uh, will uh, different students be able to uh, raise their hand or ask questions uh, during the talk? Uh, yes, um, they can either ask questions or just uh, put it in chat or the, there is a Q&A as well. Ah, terrific. Um, yeah, I think because I'm on one screen, if, uh, if people raise hands, I'll see it. Uh, I may not see the chat. So, uh, Professor, I'm counting on you to please interrupt me uh, if something comes up that would be worth uh, or if we should stop and, and talk about something as we're going through. Great. Sounds good. Awesome. Well, great. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm coming to you live from uh, Palo Alto, California, where it is 81 degrees and sunny. And just before I got here, I scared away a coyote. True story. Uh, but I'm here tonight, as uh, Professor Zhao talked about, to tell you about algorithms and art history uh, and exploring the user experience of rational agents. And it's OK if that doesn't make a lot of sense just yet. Uh, we're going to really dive into this in detail. Also. Uh, I've put all of the salient points, the key points that I'm going to talk about in text on the slides. So uh, I'm, I'm hoping that uh, it'll be clear to follow along uh, as we go through. Also, there will be points where I will be very excited to hear everyone's thoughts, and I'll make sure we have plenty of time for questions and answers at the end as well. Here's what I'm thinking we can go through today. Uh, first, it's probably kind of important to establish the definition of rational agents. What does that mean? And I'm going to propose that essentially as an alternative to uh, talking about artificial intelligence or AI. Uh, and you'll see why in a minute. Uh, and what I'd like to do as well is reflect on art and technology case studies as the way that we can think about rational agents uh, in the context of user experience. Uh, as Professor Zhao mentioned, I've been working in user experience for quite some time. Uh, my first formal experience with it uh, was 2006 uh, at Microsoft. That was the first time I was on what you would call a user experience team uh, in industry. Uh, and that was about the time I kind of became aware that that was a thing too. Uh, before that, as a technical writer, uh, was doing similar work, but didn't really call it that yet. And then finally, uh, we're going to go into a case study of why it's so important to keep humans at the center of our work, whether it's user experience or any other kind of work, honestly. Uh, and we'll illuminate that through a particular uh, powerful case study. But first, let's go into rational agents. And you're going to see a couple of uh, 
generative AI uh, art objects in this presentation. Uh, this is what I got back from Dolly, for example, when I asked it for a rational agent. Uh, I like this. If anyone's seen the movie Buckaroo Banzai, which is one of my favorite movies, this kind of reminds me of one of the aliens, but anyway. Uh, okay, here's a really super dense slide, but I made this on purpose because I want to get this all into one spot, and we're going to take some time and step through this. So, rational agents, they're pretty simple definition on the face of it. There's two things going on there. They act based on algorithms, and they do the right thing based on the goals provided. And that might sound relatively straightforward, but you can see on the right is how we problematize all of that, why it's not so straightforward and why we need to dig into every single one of these words. And every one of these words probably def deserves its own presentation, honestly, but that's okay. Uh, what I've got in quotes here, I'm pulling specifically from the source you see at the bottom there, the first one, uh, Artificial Intelligence Modern Approach by Russell and Norvig. Uh, that first came out in the mid nineties. They recently revised it in the fourth edition. I found that very helpful as at least the front matter, essentially the first chapter or two is just the elemental uh, the core, like just the intro to AI. What is it really? Because what I wanted to do was step back from that term AI and decompose this into the things that are doing the stuff, to put it technically. Uh, so rational, let's tease this all apart a little bit. What is rational and what is an agent? Rational means acting so as to achieve one's goals or one's beliefs. And I'm going to dive into a super literal reading of goals and beliefs, and you'll see why later on. And then for agent, that means uh, you have to doing the right thing. This is what's coming from the definition. So you split this up. It's something that acts to achieve one's goals and beliefs and does the right thing based on them. Uh, okay. But then there's a bunch of other terms here that, that bear some description. Uh, <laughs> and you're probably laughing because you're thinking, oh, great. This person is defining algorithm. This is super exciting. Uh, there's a reason for that. And you'll see that in a minute too. So what do I mean by an algorithm in this case? Uh, a process or set of rules to be followed in calculations or other problem solving operations. Nothing too surprising. Uh, this is what I'm thinking of as an algorithm, it's a process. It's you know, an equation. It's a way to think about uh, how to produce something. So we'll come back to that too. Uh, now in the definition for what rational agents do, they act based on algorithms, they do the right thing. The right thing, there's a lot of action there, a lot to consider. Uh, Russell and Norvig say that's defined by the goals we provide to the agent. So you can immediately see that they're only gonna do what they've been asked to do based on the goals coming from someone else, from a goal owner. And like, we'll talk about that too here in a sec. Goals and beliefs. So for goals, that's what you're trying to achieve. Uh, for example, maybe I really wanna have a table and I want that table to have four legs. Uh, okay, so my goal is to have a table with four legs. The beliefs, that's more about why. Why do I want a table with four legs? Maybe I want that for some specific purpose or whatever. Um, but that's where the accountability piece of this comes into play. So the goal is the what or the intent. What am I trying to achieve? The beliefs map to why. Why am I trying to achieve that goal? And that's where I frame this as accountability. And we'll, again, talk through that in the case study related to a particular piece of very modern art history. Uh, the phrase art history is deceptive because in this case, it's gonna be from like three weeks ago. Uh, and then finally, who are we? So you see how some of this is split out and where it says defined by the goals we provide to the agents. We is really interesting to consider. Uh, so, at a high level, you could think about that as the goal owner, but that could be a lot of different things. Uh, you can think about this like actors, like actor network theory. If you really wanna go there, that's the suggested reading below. Um, that's a bit tongue in cheek because that's not exactly light reading. Uh, if you've never really dug into actor network theory, I'm not sure that you really need to, but imagine that actors could be humans. They could be rational agents, which could be AI systems, other kinds of things. They don't have to be people. So the goal owner doesn't necessarily have to be a human, but again, we'll come back to that in a bit. Okay, this is a lot of setup. There's a good reason for that. Uh, but take a quick look at the core again, because we're gonna go through some examples to explain what am I trying to say with all this? So rational agents act based on algorithms, do the right thing based on the goals provided. Okay, what does it look like in action? So the process would be 
uh, the goal owner would define an algorithm, or you might just use one that exists based on their goals and beliefs. Uh, and how you do that is a really interesting question. We'll come back to that too. A rational agent completes the tasks that comprise the algorithm. So someone wants something for some reason. They have a goal, they have a belief, and then they engage this rational agent to make that happen, to complete those tasks. So just work through that algorithm. Um, in my case, or in, in the way I think about this, an algorithm could be something like instructions for making a peanut butter sandwich. Uh, it doesn't have to be uh, an equation. It could be, of course, but it could also be a process, procedure, that sort of thing. Okay. So that rational agent is trying to complete those tasks that the goal owner has asked it to complete. Then either during or after that process, the goal owner assesses the progress. Does it look like it's coming along the way that it should? And at the end, is the outcome what they expected? And then finally, the goal owner is going to ideally iterate the algorithm. They're gonna check whether the thing that came out the other end, the artifact, the outcome, is that what they measured it to be against what was expected? Uh, and is it what they hoped it would be? So let's go back to that example of the table. If somehow, if I engage as the goal owner, uh, if I engage someone to make a table for me with four legs and they go do that, they come back and the table has 17 legs, uh, the measured alignment between the outcome and my goal would not be very good. It would be pretty far off from what I asked for and what I was expecting. Uh, that would be kind of strange also. It's hard to imagine someone accidentally adding 13 extra legs to a table. But what you're gonna see in a minute is uh, much more extreme than that even. So keep this process in mind because what we're gonna do is take a look at what happens uh, first, just a really simple case study with using the uh, DALI uh, generative AI tool. Okay, let's use this as a case study. Uh, and there's a reason why you keep seeing, this is meant to be a capybara, uh, animal, uh, we'll come back to that, the largest rodent. Uh, okay, if you open uh, Dolly, like in a web browser, for example, if you have an account, uh, let's say that you are the goal owner. In this case, you're not defining an algorithm. Uh, all you're doing is providing some sort of input. You may not even have a defined goal or a set of beliefs. Uh, I put in kind of a random prompt. I don't have a particular goal in mind with this capybara in a blue room and I actually asked for it to look like a diamond that didn't come through quite right, but I didn't have any reason for that. I certainly don't have any beliefs about diamond capybaras and blue, I don't really care. Uh, I just asked it to make this. And then something completed the tasks. I don't know if it was rational because if I go back for a second, rational agents act based on algorithms and do the right thing based on the goals provided but I don't really know what the right thing is in this case. And in fact, that's kind of the fun of Dolly, right? Is the third step is that I look at the product. I don't really have any way to assess it other than to say, well, that's hilarious. Uh, so then that leaves us with a bunch of questions. Did this agent do the right thing? I, I don't know because I don't even know what I had in mind. <laughs> so I have no way to assess that. Uh, is this the product I wanted? I don't know. I mean, you saw a different one at the beginning. Uh, I made a few. So in this case, I'm not actually sure what's going on. I don't have any way to provide feedback directly into the algorithm. What I can do is change my prompt and I can keep experimenting and playing around, but I don't have a way to directly influence how Dolly actually does anything. Or at least if I do, I'm not aware of it. And now that's a little bit different from directly editing and other things that you can do with the images, but we'll get to that in a minute. Okay, so let's summarize real quick here. Before we get to the pop quiz, the pop quiz will be really fun. So in this case, uh, if I'm the goal owner, I provide the goals and beliefs to the rational agent, which then acts on my behalf. And that's how I'm trying to frame things with uh, algorithms and AI and some of this conversation here, that I'm the one who knows what I want and how I want it done. And I want something to go get that, do that for me, please. Um, one question that comes up pretty quickly though here, this, this interesting phrasing of the right thing, so who gets to decide when something is the right thing? And to do that, I wanna give you a pop quiz. Uh, okay, which of these two art objects was created by a rational agent? And given the way this is set up, maybe I'll take this as a rhetorical question, <laughs> um, but you've got two different paintings here. 
And what if I were to tell you that only one of them was created by a rational agent? Uh, well, let me explain why I'm saying that. So, yeah, you know, it kind of depends on who you ask. Uh, on the left, you have composition A from 1923 by Piet Mondrian. Uh, a Dutch artist and one of the leaders of uh, neoplasticism and the style. The style. Uh, on the right, you have uh, this uh, painting by Theo van Doesburg from 1925. And in the middle, you have the, the year that they had their falling out. There was a schism, essentially. Uh, up until 1924, they had been partners, collaborators, working directly together quite often. But at a certain point, they grew apart, and finally they split. And it's pretty clear that they took on different styles. So which one is the rational agent? Well, the only way to answer that, of course, is to pit them against each other in a classic art fight. And I love a good art fight. Uh, this is really one of the best parts of art history, is different people with big personalities just staking their entire careers and trying to destroy each other. So this was a classic art fight situation. So on the left, you've got Mondrian. And he's saying, look, there's two essential and opposing forces. And I express the balance of those in my art. So the positive, the negative, and this composition is just perfect, timeless, universal. Timeless is very important. On the right, you've got Van Doesburg, who's basically saying, this guy's annoying. Like what I don't I feel very limited by this at this point. You know what? Art should be more exciting. It should be more vibrant. It should have more energy. And maybe something that's timeless means something different to him. Uh, so this art fight, it went on for a little while. Um, but maybe the way to think about this would be whose algorithm creates better results? And what do I mean by this? So if you recall that an algorithm is really just the description of a process. You can imagine that Mondrian, who painted the painting on the left, just looking at it, you don't even have to know anything about Dutch art history of the early 20th century, which I swear is really interesting. Uh, you don't have to know any of that history to know that painting on the left really looks like it came from a very specific process. Like that looks like the product of an exacting scientific approach, uh, a repeatable approach. And in fact, that is the case. Uh, Mondrian had very specific rules that he imposed on himself and that he uh, published and externalized through a number of manifestos, publications. Um, one of the themes you'll find out today is early 20th century artists really liked to write manifestos. Uh, on the right, well, does that look like the right thing happened? Um, well, you know, you could say Mondrian did the right thing. He's the winner of the art fight. I mean, look at that, it's perfect. There's a reason these sell for tens of millions of dollars. Uh, the purity, the precision, the alignment with the stated goals and beliefs of which he had uh, multiple uh, of the De Steyl movement or the style movement. In this case, also interesting, the goal owner, the rational agent are the same person. It's all Pete Mondrian. It's all the same guy. Um, so it looks like he won. Uh, although, I don't know, maybe Van Doesburg did the right thing because this is kind of neat. I, I like this one. Now, what he was doing here, for him, the right thing was to react and push back against what he saw as the oppressive, overly prescriptive, but in the wrong way, uh, neoplasticism and style of Mondrian and what happened with the movement that he helped found. The big difference here, and I'll go back for a second. The thing I want to point out, I, I mentioned timeless. You see how all these lines are straight horizontal or straight vertical. None of them have any angle to them. And you see how these are at a 45 degree angle. This was actually one of the reasons for the split between these two artists. This, from Mondrian's perspective, suggests the passage of time, which is an irrational thing. It's the wrong thing. You can't be timeless if you're showing something that looks like a graph and just suggests the passage of time. So that's why you end up with this art fight. And that's why it's actually kind of hard to tell who did the right thing. So, what does this mean exactly? Like this is a um, maybe a strange place to start, perhaps early 20th century Dutch art. But let's go back to the definition. Rational agents act based on algorithms, and they do the right thing based on the goals provided. That's still kind of dense. So maybe the way to break this up is with the five Ws and the one H: the who, what, when, where, why, and how. Uh, which you use in journalism. You also use it for kids' birthday parties. 
basically the same. All right, in this case, who? These are the actors. The actors, uh, literally, like actors, actor network theory actors. Uh, it could be rational agents, the goal owners, but I could cluster them as the actors. That's who is doing the stuff. What are the goals? And that's the intent. Again, like I said, what is it you want from all this? When and where, not so important right now, but maybe a different talk. Why, the beliefs. And that's where the accountability comes into play. And that's what we're gonna talk about a lot next because again, how is the algorithms of the process. So one way to really think about this is to dig into the what and the why, the intent and accountability. And I'd like to do that by considering an old toilet. Uh, so here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna look at two more case studies to dig into what we mean by goals and intent, or goals and beliefs, intent and accountability. And let's start with that old toilet. What is this? One of my favorite things to do in San Francisco, which is pretty near to where I live, uh, when it's on display is to go to the Museum of Modern Art because they have one of these, uh, it's called Fountain, uh, it's from 1917. And the original is now lost, but there have been other reproductions, um, actually quite a few produced because it's just a mass produced uh, urinal from early 20th century in France. And we'll talk about this. But one of my favorite things to do is to go into the MoMA in San Francisco and see this object on a pedestal by itself with a lot of space around it because the, the confused looks from tourists that you get from people who maybe just went to the museum because it's fun and the first thing they're confronted with is a toilet, it's just amazing. Um, I had a 10 minute conversation with someone once about this object in that place, it was great. Uh, what is this? Like, why am I talking about this? Okay, so let me tell you the history here. In this case, the goal owner was the person who signed it, R. Mutt, who does not exist. That was a pseudonym for Marcel Duchamp, who was kind of the foil or the counterpart to Salvador Dali, by the way. Uh, interesting person to look up. So in this case, the goal owner, he didn't define an algorithm. He didn't do anything like that. He had a set of goals and beliefs. And of course he had a manifesto, but he didn't define the process. He didn't define the algorithm based on those goals or beliefs. Instead, as a rational agent who wanted to do the right thing uh, and who had the goals and beliefs, he selected a prefabricated or what he called a ready-made ready -made product. A ready-made uh, is actually the term that wound up being used for the sort of class of art object, ready-mades. Uh, the goal owner had no control over that process. He had no feedback back into the algorithm. In fact, he didn't really care about that. Um, what he cared about was something very different. Instead, he kind of went to a hardware store and bought this object and entered it into an art contest. And that's where the profit came in. What was he trying to do? Well, what he did here was he was on the jury of an art exhibition in Paris in 1917. And he wanted to make a different kind of statement about the state of art and artistry and essentially what it means to be the goal owner, honestly, or a rational agent. So he entered this under a fake uh, name into the art contest. And the Society of Independent Artists really didn't like that. Uh, this is what happened was this debate, another art fight, if you will. So on one side was the people, the board who ran this contest. And here's the quote from them. They had other stuff to say, but the fountain may be a very useful object in its place, but its place is not in an art exhibition and it is by no definition a work of art. So they reacted the way that Duchamp knew they would react, which is to say, this is a toilet, get this the hell out of our art show. Like this is, this is you know, an outrage, right? Um, but there was a counterpoint to this and it was Duchamp himself who wrote this in uh, an unfortunately named journal um, that talked about why he did this. He said, whether Mr. Mutt with his own hands made the fountain has no importance, he chose it. He took an ordinary article of life, placed it so that its useful significance disappeared under the new title and point of view, created a new thought for that object. And that's the key here that's so interesting is he's saying that he chose it. And it's, it's that intent and then the accountability of why uh, that's very important in this case study. And in fact, that was the whole point. What Duchamp was trying to do was use the what, the object, to call attention to or problematize the why. In other words, he showed that the intent 
could call into question the accountability. And his whole point was, well, I'm an artist. I can do whatever I want because I'm an artist. It gives me free license to do this sort of thing. And this was his goal, is to take something so shocking that it would cause an uproar um, because he could have put something like a vase of flowers or something kind of you know, less uh, confrontational, but he didn't. He chose a toilet and it definitely caused controversy. Uh, and the whole point was to raise questions about intent and artistry, what it means to be an artist. And it called attention to accountability in the early 20th century art world. Okay, that's enough about toilets. <laughs> Let's take a look at something a little newer. And in this case, we have what's called the theater, the opera special, uh, Jason Allen. Uh, this work recently won an award for, uh, in an art contest. You can see where I'm going with this probably if you read the press about this, but this was several weeks ago, not long ago. Uh, but let's take this as an example and as kind of a counterpoint or building on Duchamp's fountain. Okay, so in this case, Allen, the artist, has a set of goals and beliefs but again, he does not define an algorithm based on his goals and beliefs. So far, this is the same as what we found with uh, Fountain. Next, a rational agent completes the tasks that comprise the ready-made algorithm and fabricates a product. In other words, the algorithm itself isn't changing as a result of this, at least not perceptibly necessarily. Probably it is somehow, but you can't really inspect that. Uh, and then it fabricates a product. It gives you some results, kind of like the diamond copy borrows in the blue room. The goal owner in this case is Alan, but he's not the rational agent. And that's an important distinction we'll come back to. The goal owner, Alan, has some control over the fabrication process. He can give it different prompts to the tool, in this case, mid-journey. But he doesn't have control over the, and I say he, because he is an artist, he's the person here. He, Alan, does not have any control over the algorithm that generated the product. So he can keep iterating the prompts and get different things, but he can't go in and change the actual algorithm directly. Like he can't tweak the process itself. In fact, he can't even really see it. And again, that means he can't iterate the algorithm. He can't really check whether it's meeting his needs. He kind of just does stuff until it looks the way he wants. And then he goes and does something else. And that's what this talks about. So again, kind of like with the fountain, You've got an art fight. You've got a debate. What is art? What is this heresy? This is horrible, right? So there's a bunch of outcry. When this, when this came out and won an award, the fact that it was an AI-generated object caused a lot of, uh, well, a lot of controversy, I would say. So for example, we're watching the death of artistry unfold right before our eyes. Now, this isn't the first time this has happened. Uh, in the world of art history, one of the most significant times this happened previously was uh, with the advent and then popularization of photography in the 19th century. And if you go back even further, uh, the advent of the book actually caused similar concern. Uh, when these new technologies arise, this always happens, uh, honestly. It happened with computers, um, using a calculator to do your math for you, right? Th these kinds of comments come up every single time. Um, and I'm not saying they're right or wrong. I'm just pointing out that there's plenty of people who feel this way. So what did Jason Allen say about this though? So he said, I've been exploring a special prompt. I'll be publishing at a later date. So he's gonna explain how he generated the source for this. Uh, I've created hundreds of images using it after many weeks of fine tuning and curating my generations or my gens. I chose my top three and had them printed on canvas. I generate images with mid journey MJ do passes with Photoshop and upscale with Gigapixel. Now, I'm going to pause here because I see, uh, I can tell there appears to be a question or, so Professor Zhao, maybe you can jump in and help me out here. Yes, uh, let me see what the, what the question is here. Um, Q&A. The display is strange on my computer that I can't seem to bring it up. Um, so let me switch to a different um, screen and maybe the whole thing would just, you know, fit. Yeah, I would click it myself, but I'm afraid to mess up my whole setup. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
I can't see the question. All right, let me see if I, oh, uh, I've got it. Anonymous okay. attendee says, if I made and implemented an algorithm and used it to create art for a contest, would this make me the sole rational agent? Great question. It depends somewhat. So in fact, let me get the cursor back. The best way to answer that, just looking back at my slides, I'm gonna jump backwards really quickly. I apologize. All the way back before this art fight to right here. Okay. So thank you for this question. Uh, right, so imagine that you've written your own algorithm and you've implemented it somehow, whatever that means. That could mean lots of things. Um, even to jump to something like a machine learning model is a bit of too far of a leap, but imagine that you've made and implemented an algorithm and then you somehow use that, whatever that might mean to create art for a contest. Would that make you the sole rational agent? Uh, I'd say the answer is maybe, <laughs> uh, because the, you know, also the answer is it depends. I'm, I'm mostly a social scientist, mostly focused on qualitative research. So my answer oftentimes is it depends, uh, but it's true here too. It depends on what control means and end to end understanding the entire workflow uh, and order of operations. So I'd say it's possible. Um, what really gets interesting though, is if I jump to, oh, here we go. Let me jump to something entirely different. That's a secret in the appendix. You get a secret slide here. Uh, this is why it's complicated is because, well, I'm not even sure that it matters if you're the sole rational agent. So a different case study that we're not gonna talk about today, and we'll jump back to the body of this in a minute. Um, Donald Judd was an artist in kind of the second half of the 20th century working in the US, uh, New York and Texas, and then around the world actually in different installations. Um, he worked with uh, a number of different people who were the rational agents. And these were actual people like Peter Ballantyne was the fabricator that constructed this work uh, out of wood or like, here's a great picture. Um, the artist is on the right and the person on the left, Jose Otero, was a technician at this particular uh, sheet metal company. And so the artist was there explaining to him what he wanted. Um, so then the question gets really interesting about, well, wait, there's a sole goal owner. So there's only one person who's the goal owner here. And that's the artist, the person in that uh, very snazzy coat there on the right. But then is he also the rational agent? Well, in this case expressly, no, he definitely was not. And what's interesting is, does that matter? Like, what does that mean? I'm not sure. So uh, thank you for that question. And let's, let me jump back here to uh, this example again. Uh, and also please feel free to keep the questions coming. It's a great question. Um, so what happened in this case with Jason Allen? And if I go back one more time for the context, I like this because he's laying out his process, but what you can see is he's using tools, mid journey, Photoshop, gigapixel. These are tools, like Photoshop is a great example. When you use Photoshop, you're not changing Photoshop. You're not modifying the underlying algorithms. Um, but what happened here is this work went a bit further is that it wasn't just showing something and that made everyone concerned about uh, why, like what were this person's beliefs, how he did it, that the process itself problematized the why, the beliefs, the accountability because everyone said, well, wait, you did this by having a computer do it. You're not an artist, that's not real, that's, that's not fair. Uh, he didn't go about it for that reason, but he wound up calling this into question in the same way that Duchamp did a hundred years ago, that photography did before that, and then even the book did before that. And of course, Jason Allen is not the only artist uh, who was doing this, but the fact that it won an award and got all this mostly negative attention uh, is very interesting to see. Okay, here's a very dense slide and there's some good reasons for this uh, density right here. And that's because I wanna bring this back to what I promised to talk about, exploring the user experience of rational agents. Uh, what's going on here? Okay, we know that rational agents act based on algorithms, do the right thing based on the goals provided. We know that goals describe what we want, beliefs describe why we want it, and algorithms describe how we'll get there. Uh, Pretty simple. Part of why I describe it this way, like I talk about a goal owner, 
is because that, that does tend to be some of the language we use in, in the tech industry. You know, if you're working on a project with people, you'll have a goal owner. You, you set goals or objectives and have key results and all that sort of thing. Certainly when I worked at Amazon, you literally, they're called goals and you can only have one person who owns a goal. Uh, so you have a very literal goal owner and then you have a lot of rational agents doing the work. Uh, the point here though, is if you especially work in user experience as a profession, uh, you have to ensure that others are acting accountably. What are their beliefs? Like, why are we taking this goal? Why is this so important? Okay, the way we do this is to bring human needs, human wants into the equation, literally the equation. Part of our job as user experience professionals is to design or redesign the algorithms that account for all these requirements, the processes that help us achieve those goals. And this is very important. Uh, and I say it's very important, not from the uh, corporate sense, like, hey, we should achieve that goal so we can make a lot of money. It, it's important from a human perspective for so many reasons. And so the final case study I wanna walk through, uh, it talks about a technology and the evolution of it and how bias was encoded so richly into it that it, it took decades to unwind and we still really haven't fixed it, honestly. So to talk about this example, we need to go back to the 1950s, roughly. And that's when color photo printers from Kodak were being used all over the world, uh, thousands of them everywhere. Now the challenge is if any of you have ever worked in film development or photography, if you've had to do this uh, yourself, uh, calibrating these machines is difficult, especially calibrating uh, for color photo finishing and printing. Uh, it takes some time. You have to do it every day if you are uh, printing photos. And so one of the things that Kodak decided to do to make this easier was to provide reference image. And they made these reference photos. They called them Shirley cards. And it's because originally uh, Shirley Page, this woman on the right, was uh, the model for these reference cards. And the point of the card was to introduce a certain set of colors that the technician would color balance against the skin tone of the model. So that's a pretty important point. We'll talk more about that. Now the challenge here is, okay, so the goal was to calibrate color photo printers around the world. Uh, that's a fair goal, but it's a goal based purely on technology. There's no real human in the loop there, so to speak. And the belief, of course, the intent and the accountability, again, to use those terms, in this case, the belief, the why, is that you'd get perfect color calibration. So if the goal is to calibrate, the belief is this is how we get there if we make these reference images, these Shirley cards. The issue with this though, is what happens when accountability, when the belief is based purely on the technical outcome? Again, there's no human in the loop here. So let's go back a bit and look at what things used to be like with Kodak film development. Uh, okay, in this case, you do have some goal owners and uh, rational agents who are different people. Uh, the goal owners in this case would be the scientists at Kodak. They're the people that make these machines, make the choices about what to send out into the world for the uh, uh, photos to calibrate the machines. They define the algorithm. In this case, the process of developing color film, the color printer calibration process based on their goals and beliefs, which we just shared. Now out in the field, this is an actual photo. Uh, they, <laughs> I am old enough to remember these little huts, film huts. Uh, in fact, I think that might be what they drive into in Back to the Future by accident at the end of the movie. Like there's a film hut in that parking lot. I could be wrong. Um, but they used to be around uh, and there'd be someone in there and they'd be developing film all day. And they would be this photo finishing technician. They're completing the tasks that comprise the algorithm. So far, this tracks pretty well with the process we outlined earlier. Uh, now, in this case, the goal owner is not assessing the progress, the rational agent is. That means the person literally in the booth, in the field, they're assessing the progress at the outcome level. They're checking the uh, film they're printing against the reference image. And then the rational agent compares the output with the reference photo. And then if they, they're not iterating the algorithm in this case, they're just tuning the machine to get them to align. So it's a bit of a difference there. Okay, so far you might be thinking, 
all right, you've got a person in a hut trying to print photos. What's the problem with that? The big problem with that is that this was based on uh, a function of biased beliefs is how I put it. So rational agents were doing the right thing as Kodak described it based on the goals provided. But to do the right thing here, the rational thing to do was based on as a function uh, based on uh, biased beliefs. And that's how they were assessing things. When I say biased beliefs, these are a couple of images where what happens is if you take a photo with this film back then, and then you had it printed, uh, people with darker skin color would not show up clearly. And in particular, in the bottom picture, you can see that the, the two kids that have paler skin or the doll that has very pale skin show up pretty clearly. But the other people in the photo don't show up quite as clearly. And the thing that's so crucial about this is that was by design. Whether it was intentional or accidental, we'll talk about that in a minute, actually. That kind of doesn't matter, though. It's by design. And that's the whole problem with this, is that doing the right thing was not the right thing at all. And it took decades for this to become even uh, noticed as an issue. It's, it's tragic, honestly. So who is empowered to assess and change the behavior of rational agents? Because if you think about this person in this hut, they're just doing what they've been told to do. They've got the reference image and they're developing film so that it comes out the way that it's meant to based on reference cards like this. And you can find other ones online if you're curious. They're pretty intense. Uh, so in this case, other business goals inform the changes. So you might look at this and then you might think, oh, well, to some degree, this has been addressed. Uh, let's take a look at what happened here. So this photo is an example of a more modern, but still not modern, uh, Shirley card. I think in this case, it's from the 80s. Uh, and in this case, also you have uh, people representing different backgrounds in the same image because they were trying to be, trying to be more equitable <laughs> with the reference image. But why they got there, how they got there, that's a bit of the issue here. So you've got a couple of quotes that I found interesting here. Uh, there's some interviews with one of the photographers that uh, tried to iterate this process at the source, like actually change the algorithm. And in this case, this person said, well, it wasn't a big deal. It just seemed like the right thing to do. In this case, the right thing to do was to change the way that this worked. I wasn't attempting to be politically correct. I was just trying to give us a chance of making a better film, one that reproduced everyone's skin tone in an appropriate way. And that's what the photographer said. Um, there's also a really interesting, and you can read other long form articles about uh, this topic of racial bias in photography. Uh, they painted different pictures, so to speak. The chocolate industry was disappointed in Kodak because they could not differentiate between white and dark chocolate in their ads. And the furniture industry complained that the film could not sufficiently differentiate between shades of wood. And that's more of a business need, right? That's not so much of a human need, that's a business need. Uh, and I'm gonna pause here for a sec because I see some chat, although let's see if I can bring it back. Ah. Okay, uh, there's a question about, is finding the right thing an algorithm itself? Is it uh, more of a hypothesis to be tested? Yeah, thanks for the question, Michael. That's, and that's a, <laughs> that's a key question that, yeah, you get into a very meta conversation here because uh, finding the right thing is an iterative process in and of itself. Um, and you could, yeah, you could set this up as hypotheses to be tested. That sounds like we should come back to that in the Q&A because I think there's more to dig into there. Also, uh, Professor Zhao, there was something in the chat and when I clicked it, I couldn't see it. Was there anything in the chat? Yeah, there was nothing. I was just telling people to put their questions in chat. <laughs> Thinking of meta, yeah, nice. Okay, cool. Great. Well. Part of why I'm showing you this example as well, it's still an issue today. <laughs> uh, and it's, it's still pretty tragic. So this is an example that I pulled and I'll talk about this uh, in a minute, but I'm showing you this because this is why user experience is such an important role. I'd say mission critical, as we might say in industry, as in you can't achieve what you're trying to achieve without it. Uh, it's not just the tech industry either, but I'm kind of pointing out the tech industry here. Uh, recall that rational agents act based on algorithms, do the right thing based on the goals provided. Our job, my job, for example, as a user experience professional, 
to keep humans at the center of these goals. Uh, and also, I put this in kind of an academic way, but I like these words, externalize and interrogate the beliefs that form the basis of the actions and products of those rational agents. And that speaks a bit to Michael's question too. Like, unless you can surface and look at and question and then change those beliefs, uh, it's gonna be hard to update those algorithms to do the right thing, where the right thing is something that we should be defining. So maybe one way to summarize is we advocate for the right thing. Uh, what you see on the right, and then I'll take a look at the Q&A because uh, at this point, this is almost the last slide. Uh, this is an example just from a couple of years ago of, uh, I think it was Zoom and it was this person on the bottom and they were talking with one of their colleagues at their university and their colleagues said, yeah, I don't like the video replacement because it erases my face. And they had this whole conversation about it. And if you go look at the Twitter thread, when they posted it on Twitter, it actually exposed yet another set of bias that was built into the algorithms. It, it was kind of amazing. Uh, and, and again, I would say tragic. Um, oh, and I see, the, <laughs> I see the third question is that the host has disabled attendee chat. Um, yeah, that's fine. You can, you can just use the Q&A. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Why is this still so important? Well, uh, another reason this is so important is if you take a look at this brand new article from Sequoia Capital uh, called Generative AI, A Creative New World, uh, one of the things you're going to see in there is this chart. And this chart, as you go from left to right, uh, the rows are the different uh, media modes. So this is like a multimodal list. And then the columns are telling you, as we move through time, where are we in uh, the level of quality of generative products, like literally AI-based rational agents doing stuff. And what you see here is, uh, just take the text row at the top. Uh, so up until 2020, you know, machine learning models and other things would be able to do some spam detection, translation for sure, that's a big use case, um, basic Q&A. But then as you go into the future, their prediction is, oh, you know, by 2025, maybe we'll have final drafts better than the human average of what an average, whatever that means, average person could produce. And then once you get into 2030, it'll just outshine even the best professional writers. It'll be better than anything any of us can create. And then you'll see a theme there in that final column. And what I would suggest is as user experience professionals, this is what we need to push back on because unless you know where all of this, uh, these goals are coming from, the beliefs, what they are, how you can change them, uh, and that future kind of frightens me a bit. Um, there's a lot more that we could have talked about uh, exploring the future of UX, trying to tease apart goal owners and rational agents. Um, one of my favorite topics is that there's actually more than one form of collaboration. One of those forms is adversarial collaboration. And that's when you have two different groups uh, working together, collaborating, but they have different goals. They don't share a goal. Um, legal teams, sales teams and companies often are fighting with each other because they have their own goals that are different from each other, but they have to work together for certain reasons. That's a really interesting topic. And of course, learning the tools to advocate for human-centered goals and what that looks like. That would also be a great topic to talk about. But at this point, um, I just wanna say, thank you very much for the time so far. Uh, that was a lot of talking. Hopefully you're all alert, awake. <laughs> um, I thought you'd enjoy this generative image of someone receiving a bouquet of flowers from a tiger. I thought this was great. Uh, Professor Zhao, how would you like to handle uh, the Q&A discussion part? Well, we can start the Q&A now. Great, should I stop uh, sharing or what would be? Um, I think it might be better to leave it here just so that people, people might refer to your slides. Okay, cool. Let's see, I, in that case, I will jump back to, I'm happy to jump around too, so I can, I'll leave it here for a bit with all the definitions, but yeah, please, happy to, happy to talk more. I don't know if people can directly use audio or put questions in the Q&A, whatever works.
Um, I please put your question in the Q and A, and I can now I can see all the Q and A questions. Awesome. <clears throat> Yeah, there's that was a fantastic talk. Thank you, Alex. I know that I have some questions, but I'll give the priority to the to our audience here. Yeah, it's it's a lot to take in and uh, covers a lot of ground. So yeah, and you know, let's we can see if anyone has any questions first. But feel free to get us started too if you like. Let's see if uh, well here we have a question. What techniques help to interrogate the goals? Mm. <clears throat> All right, let's take a look. I gotta close that window. Uh, ooh, I like this question a lot. And I saw that raised hand, but yeah, okay, put it in the Q&A too. Um, so the what is the intent? In fact, let me jump to a slide that lays this out again. Um, doo -doo -doo -doo. Sorry, let's jump past the art fight. Okay. What techniques uh, help to interrogate the goals? Well, this sounds kind of obvious, <laughs> but one of the first things that's important to do is ask people what to write down the goal or to define the goal. You might be surprised how hard that is to do. Um, in the tech industry, if you're working on a project, you can take for granted that people have goals. However, it's not always clear what they are. Um, so the place to start is often just by asking the questions about what are you trying to achieve? What are your goals? Um, and then being able to dig into that in more detail. I know that sounds pretty, pretty fundamental, but you might be surprised how difficult it is just to get down to the basis of why work is being done. Um, this was a joke. I won't say which company, but it's not my current company. I used to work at a different company. And the joke was that you would do the project and then once you were done, you would write the requirements document, which would define what the project was supposed to be. You would do that when you were done with the project, so you could check the box saying that you had the requirements document, but you would do that at the end. You would just finish the project first. Uh, very, very true. Um, that sounds pretty simple, but that's where I'd start. Um, beyond that too, uh, you know, if you wanna get more into like a user research focus, expert interviews can help, like to go talk to different people uh, on a team to understand what they think they're doing. Um, this is also important to understand how people are prioritizing different things, because uh, it's not always clear whether people even share the same goal. So that's one technique, which again sounds simple, but start by asking questions about what the goals are. Uh, another technique that I find useful is to go figure out where the action is, so to speak, with the different artifacts that a team works on. So the dissertation work that I did was all about understanding collaboration. And one of the things that I found was uh, when teams, uh, especially designers, for example, but all teams do this, when teams come together to work on a shared goal, they'll generate a lot of different artifacts, uh, sticky notes, uh, documents, whiteboard sketches, code, uh, design mockups, you name it, all kinds of stuff. What you wanna do is try to identify which of those artifacts is what I call the anchoring artifact. In other words, where is the negotiation process being sorted out? Like, why are they doing all that work? Sometimes this happens on a whiteboard uh, where everyone comes together, you have a brainstorm session, you sketch a bunch, and then everyone takes photos of it or whatever. And then there's a piece of it that you refer to later because that was the thing that everyone agreed was what you were trying to do. So that's another great way to interrogate the goals is again, to externalize them by trying to find where is all the attention being paid on this team? What document or what artifact are people using uh, to negotiate what they're working on? Uh, that should happen through a, like a product requirements document, for example. But again, like I said, sometimes you write that at the end of the project, which is very strange. I hope that helps uh, provide some more context there. Um, but yeah, thank you for that question. Uh, I have a question. Um, it sounds like much of this um, bias um, exists in the why, in the beliefs. Um, how do we go about uh, becoming aware of the bias in our mm -hmm. beliefs? How do we know? Uh, what do we think of? It sounds very open. Um, and how do we go about that? 
Yeah, that's much tougher. <laughs> um, I can give examples of that, but I think that's where, if we take this sort of uh, in a stepwise process. So I thought it was a great question to lead with about how do you interrogate the goals? Like what techniques would you use? So that's where you, you ask the questions, uh, you figure out why people are doing the work or like why they think they are. But then in the process of hearing answers to those questions, you hear people start to express their beliefs. The, a, a good example will be, uh, I want a table with four legs because I need it to uh, hold all of the food that my family and I are going to put on it. And then when you hear that, as a researcher, for example, you can say, oh, your family, like, tell me more about your family. Um, and they'll say, oh, yeah, well, I have a, you know, a partner, we have three children, so the table needs to be this big because I want to make sure we can all sit down to dinner together. And then you can start to dig into the reasons that motivated the goal in the first place. The tricky thing about this, uh, Chenzhou, is like people don't always know what these are. <laughs> uh, it can be really tough. And then, especially when you work in a company that's full of algorithms, you know, I mean, just many, many complex processes behind the scenes get you Amazon search, for example. It's not just one algorithm. Over time, the people who made those aren't there anymore. Most of the people are, you're maintaining them or you're iterating them perhaps. So when people do iterate them, that is a chance to say, hey, you know, I feel like we could do a better job of this. Um, why are we doing it this way? Like I see that the goal is to reduce latency by five milliseconds, but why would we do it this way? Um, again, I think it comes back to more conversation, but like this is such a deep topic that there's a lot more to talk about. So I'll, I'll pause there and see if you have more thoughts or you wanna switch it up at all. Well, I, th that's a great answer. And I, you know, I think that, yeah, I was just looking for like, you know, some of the things that maybe you have tried or, you know, heard of, I know that this is, you know, all emerging and it's all very exciting. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, I can give you, I have to be careful how much I share from previous roles, but I can give you, let's, let's take it to that realm of, yeah, like techniques. That's a good idea. Um, it really helps to be, uh, an active listener when, when you're talking about goals, uh, especially if people have trouble formulating or explaining why they have goals, that can be a sign that they, they're not entirely sure what their beliefs are. Um, I'll think of another example. I mean, oftentimes the beliefs are based on the alignment of the business objectives with user needs. So the belief will be, if we make this thing, we'll solve this problem for our users. That's why we need to do it. So the belief and the accountability is, uh, if I make this thing and then you check to make sure that it meets those needs and you find that it does, then you've held me accountable, that's a good thing. And we've achieved the intent. So the, the why in that case is, well, we wanna solve a problem for users. The challenge is oftentimes those beliefs uh, come across as, well, we really think that users want to share photos, or we think that people want to uh, print on the go. And the challenge with that is then the belief would be that people want to print anything, or like that they wake up in the morning and say, I can't wait to print something. And so your job as a user experience professional is to say, I don't know if that's a belief so much as still kind of a goal, actually. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, thank you. Um, other questions from our audience? Yeah, happy to take others too. Feel free to, and I know I saw a hand from Michael, but yeah, if you have a follow-up question too about, you know, finding the right thing, happy to, happy to address that too. Well, I'm, it's not exactly a question, but I'm, you know, there are many things that I've been thinking about when you're talking about this and, you know, the algorithms being kind of this black box, like um, we, we can't see it, we don't know what's going on. And that reminded me of, you know, the increasing number of things that we have in life, like, you know, content being created by uh, 
um, you know, uh, machines and chatbots interacting with us, um, you know, um, uh, autofill and, you know, a, a, a lot of these things are automated and, uh, and people, you know, it makes people uh, sit back and relax and there is a, there could be an automation bias there um, um, that people think that this is the, you know, neutral or objective, uh, reliable um, sort of system that's based on data. Um, and it also got me to think um, about, uh, let's say, you know, surveillance, um, you know, organizations or governments are using um, artificial intelligence uh, to kind of, you know, to, um, to keep an eye on their population. Um, and, and so, you know, I, I can see lots of um, uh, ways that this could you know, uh, be led astray, that people are, you know, <laughs> that people are in trouble for the wrong reasons, um, or that they could be excluded from opportunities. Um, you know, I don't have a question yet, but it just got me into well, thinking all of those things. I mean, you, you raise a great point. Part of why I'm showing this example is because there have been articles lately about the challenges of, say, AI-based facial detection and recognition with uh, across the palette of skin tones that people have. Um, and there's some pretty interesting sources on that. Interesting, uh, sad, depressing, um, and interesting because yes, like the, the way that these tools are constructed, they're only as good as their, their data set at first. So uh, yeah, there's also, well, there's another interesting one I can come back to in a minute, but I, I wanna call out, there's a, a question, a couple of questions in the chat, one of them, uh, the first one is, it sounds like the goals could be wrong based on beliefs that are biased. Is a goal of UX to figure that out? Yes, <laughs> absolutely. That is, I think, the challenge, the difficulty, and the value of user experience, uh, a big piece of it is understanding, getting to the core of why people have the goals they have and then inspecting and changing them to make sure that they're ser like serving human needs uh, as much as possible. So yeah, I'll, I'll tell you that it, unless it's the user experience professionals doing that, uh, there may not always be other people in the room that are thinking this way. Um, and that's why I think it's such an important piece of uh, UX as a profession. It's, it's partly because again, if I show you this chart, this chart should terrify everybody, not because we'll eventually get to this point, but the idea that I, I don't see people represented in this. I, just, I see technology capability, but what I don't see is humans in the loop. And unless we as user experience professionals and advocates bring people back into that loop, uh, then, I mean, do we really want this? <laughs> is another question. Um, so yes, I think it's very much a goal of UX to figure that out. It's it's not easy. Yeah, please. Um, there is another question. Um, how do we quantify whether our right thing is right? Measuring this seems hard because it's so vague. Uh, oh, let's talk about that one. I let me see if I have a good place to pause the slides. Uh, maybe this is a good place where this is in the appendix. Um, okay. I've got this here because these are, these are not my challenges, by the way. These are from an article that was looking ahead at what are some of the key algorithm design challenges. Um, but to answer this question, this goes all the way back to, uh, I'll start off with an example of some work that I did when I was still uh, kind of an early mid-career professional uh, at Microsoft. And we were working on this project to make a webcam. And we were making the software because back in the day, you wanted to install the software so that Microsoft Windows would recognize the webcam when you plugged it in because you couldn't just plug something in. Anyway, that's the, the world that we used to live in. Um, so we we're working on this project. We were designing the software. And what we were trying to figure out is if you put it all in a box and you put it on a shelf, and if you go into a store like Best Buy, um, how do we convince people when they get home that instead of doing the thing they really want to do, which is take out the webcam and plug in the USB cable into their computer, 
how do we get them to put the CD-ROM drive or in the CD-ROM into the CD drive first, install the software, and then plug in the camera? Because then it's going to work much better. Uh, this was a tricky thing. And what we had to do was a naturalistic study. We like replicated a uh, store shelf. We had people walk through the process. But then we hit this snag. And the snag was one of the executives and then more people saying, well, how long does the setup process take? And it could be anywhere from two minutes to 30 minutes, <laughs> 40 minutes, um, depending on how much software your Windows computer needed to have installed. And so this caused kind of a freak out. You can imagine that people said, 30 to 40 minutes to install software before I can even use my webcam. That's a horrible experience. This is a terrible idea. And so we had to design a study to figure out what are people's expectations though? Like, is it actually bad? And so to answer this question, Michael, about how do you quantify whether the right thing is right? In this case, here's how we handled that. We said, okay, we need to understand what people's expectations will be before they have this experience with this product. They go through the experience. And then after they've gone through the setup process, we need to check with them to see, did this exceed or meet or fail to meet your expectations? And this is what we did. And what was really funny about this in this case, what we found is we actually met people's expectations because their expectations were very low because Microsoft software was annoying to set up. And so they came into it thinking, this is gonna suck. And, oh, what do you know? I'm right. So my expectations are met. And so all of this concern about, oh my gosh, it's gonna take forever. It turns out that's what people kind of were expecting. So they were like, whatever, it's fine. And so this is, I'm telling you this story partly because I can't tell you some other details. I wish I could tell you, but here's what I can tell you, that this is all about perception uh, and how to measure perception. And so if you want to keep people at the center of what you do, if you want humans in the loop, so to speak, and you want to set human-centered goals, you're going to need to measure, find ways to measure humans' perceptions of the experiences to see if they think it's the right thing. Uh, that is a huge area of user experience research and work, qualitative and quantitative. There's so much to dig into there. Um, but classically, that's how you answer that. You do a bunch of research into people's perceptions of an experience. And then you ask, I mean, what you want to do is ask them, are we doing the right thing? Uh, but you can't ask people that directly because they don't know how to answer that. So you have to construct uh, research methods and questions to get at that core question. And the best way to do that, maybe not the best, one good way to do that is by assessing perceptions, especially pre and post experience. Um, I hope that helps provide some context on that. There's uh, papers and all kinds of stuff on this too that are, that are worth reading. Any other questions from our audience? Jump back here. We still have some time and we can get a few more questions in. And here was that set of proposed questions again in case like there's there's more areas we could dig into, of course, but but yeah, curious if there's any other questions. Professor Jean, do you have any other questions or things that? Uh, I, it, 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 I was just taking my time to actually read the four things. I think <laughs> I have to unpack them. <laughs> yeah, there, this was the, yes, there's a lot there. Well, there yeah. is another question here. How do you balance importance and priority between UX and UI? Mm. These are these are excellent questions. These are right on target. Like these are the these are the good the good questions to be asking. Um, balance importance and priority. Mm. Well, it depends. <laughs> it depends on your process. Um, ideally, if you're getting to uh, if you're talking about working in say like a tech 
company, like in a, in a development environment. Um, there are uh, specific trade-offs that you have to make between, there's, there's I guess, let's, let me back up for a minute. Uh, anytime you're doing work at a company, you have to trade off the business outcomes that you want. So revenue or you know customers, that kind of thing. Uh, you have to figure out how to balance those needs, which keep the business going with the user needs, which hopefully you're meeting, but also with the technical capabilities. So when uh, Professor Zhao mentioned up front that a lot of my work is focused on the social technical gap, um, which that's Ackerman who really started that. Part of what I like about that framing is it's all about understanding what people want, uh, this is the social, and what we're capable of creating, the technical. And there's always going to be this gap that you kind of bridge with products and with other things that you make. You're never going to close the gap. You're really just you're trying to bring together what is it people want to do and how do we help them do it? Uh, so when you get to like this question about balancing importance and priority between UX and UI, it's probably worth unpacking that a bit too, because you know, I think about the UI as a component of the UX, I suppose. So, you know, if you're saying, ah, like, wait, how do we know how to design this interface or how do we trade that off against performance, for example? It's a great, great question. Um, like we could have a terrific autocomplete experience, but if it takes 30 seconds for the page to load, it's probably not gonna work. Um, some of this comes through iterative testing. Some of it comes through uh, having hypotheses that you test, that's actually really important. So a hypothesis might be users will be willing to use this system as long as the latency is under 100 milliseconds, something like this. And then you can go vary that and test it and see what are the boundaries of acceptable latency responsiveness in an interface, for example. Um, I'm not gonna be able to answer that totally, uh, completely in 30 seconds or, or less. So <laughs> um, that's a great question. We should come back to that because I see there's a couple other questions. Um, and I love the daily work at Google question. I'll tell you more about that too. Um, do you think we're getting better at incorporating the UX and human component? Are we anywhere near where we need to be headed? Uh, yes, I think we are getting better. Uh, partly because we can talk about user experience as a discipline, as a funded thing. Uh, 20 years ago, it wasn't quite like that. Um, also, uh, there's another example that comes, actually comes from uh, technical communication. And I'll share an example here, and Professor Zhao, you should jump in too, to love to hear what you think. But if you look back at the history of the field of technical writing and technical communication, and at least in you know, the modern history, and it came out of World War II, out of Purdue, there are different models of what, and I'm taking this all the way back to Professor Sauer's class, which we took together 20 years ago, Professor. Uh, we were in that class, I think, together a long time ago. So we read this article about, initially the idea was, it was all about uh, signal to noise ratio. And a technical writer, their job was to transmit information as clearly as possible from one source to another to keep the signal as high as possible and introduce as little noise as possible. And that was the transmitter model. And then eventually people looked at that and said, that doesn't give us much power or authority. So what if we think of it as the translator? Like we're not just taking information and passing it along. We're also trying to figure out what do they really mean? Like why, what is their intent? So that's more like what a translator does, for example, when they translate uh, uh, languages. You're trying to capture more the intent, not the literal signal to noise. You're not just transmitting. But then they took that a step further and there was this third wave of technical writing uh, uh, empowerment, let's say, of what if you could be more the interpreter? Like you're not just conveying it, you're actually trying to make meaning uh, with the person who's the source on behalf of the person who needs to receive that information. So you have more of a point of view that you inject into this. And then eventually there's sort of this fourth state of advocate where you say, okay, I hear what you're trying to say, but actually I wanna reframe that with you and make it more human centered perhaps. And then here's what we're gonna produce at the other end. So it's more of a partnership. You're, you're not just a mediator, you're an advocate for someone on someone's behalf. And that's a long way of saying, that's why I think we're getting better at incorporating the human component is because if you look back to where we were in the 1950s or 60s, we were in that world of the transmitter where 
you know, someone who had the equivalent of, an, equivalent of an early user experience job, they were not valued for their knowledge. They were valued for their typing skills. Like literally, that was it. So uh, I think we've come a long way. Are we anywhere near where we need to be heading? That's almost a religious question, but I will say, uh, yeah, I think we're closer. But every day there's reminders of how we're not. <laughs> so uh, I'll leave that there. Professor, is there anything you want to add to this before we take that final question? Yes, you just reminded me a lot of new topics. <laughs> uh, you know, in terms of writing, I mean, you talk about the end of art history. We're seeing the end of writing in a way that there are now books written by machines, by artificial intelligence. Um, and we also see the technical writer taking on the role of nudge. And that is to nudge people based on the information that you know about your users, the information that you did not know until you had big data, you had artificial intelligence, that these documents now show you, you know, not only how much you have uh, purchased, but what your neighbors do, how you compare it to, to your neighbors, uh, how to save energy, and all of these kinds of, you know, with, with assumed goals in it. And, with, and it makes users question, well, what is the data out there? What is included, what isn't? Um, is it really reliable? Is it comprehensive? Um, uh, so, like, you know, I think that, it's, that this, this is almost yet another new role that, that communicators are, are, are taking on. Um, wh what do you think about that? Oh, I, I agree. I think, I remember drawing this chart once when I taught in the, the program at the University of Washington, and I put dollar signs next to each level. <laughs> as to reflect the salary that you can try to earn depending on where you fit into that. Because the more that you get closer to being an advocate, the more valuable your role is and the less easily it is to have it automated out of existence, right? Because, you know, we can have this meeting uh, transcribed if we want to automatically at this point. Um, you don't need someone sitting there typing out the transcription. You can do that automatically. And, you know, it's not great. That's what the closed captioning provides as well in real time. And it's not perfect, but even 10, 15 years ago, it certainly wasn't an automated thing. But the goal of that tool is to transmit the data as literally as possible. And so that's, you know, not quite state of the art, you can do better, but that's, that's roughly where you are with the automated version of that. Um, but yeah, like, this is also, so maybe to tie this to the final question to around uh, Google, um, at Google, they're called UX writers now. Like the, so the discipline itself is a user experience writer. Um, and I like that too, because you, sometimes you see content strategist, I've, I've had that role too, technical writer, uh, technical communicate information architect. There's a lot of different versions of this. UX writer is a nice title because Essentially, what you're saying is, well, you're a partner in developing the experience, and you have a set of expertise of conveying information, establishing taxonomies and architectures, thinking strategically about, you know, as you become more senior, the level of responsibility that you have, you're, you're advocating at a whole different level for how to organize all the content, like it, it gets much bigger. So, yeah, there's a lot there. All right, um, any other questions? Oh yeah, so I, I have not actually answered the final one that's in there, sorry. Uh, what does my daily work at Google look like? Um, whenever I hear this question, I always like to say, I should tell you about a typical week uh, because a typical, there is no real typical day. Um, oh my gosh, yeah. So a typical week at Google for me is uh, a lot of meetings, tremendous number of meetings. And that's partly because a lot of the work that I do at Google is very much about uh, interpersonal communication. Uh, a lot of the, the work, the effort that I put in is alignment work, calibrating with other people, uh, and then trying to keep things aligned. And there's, in fact, if you look up, um, there's a famous uh, joke, essentially, of different org charts at different companies. And uh, the one for Google is like this insanely matrixed view of everyone's connected to everyone else somehow. <laughs> uh, that's really true. So a typical day or even week for me at Google is a lot of meetings to meet with a lot of people about a lot of things. Um, but 
I don't mean that tongue in cheek, like literally that is a lot of what I do is a lot of conversation around different topics. Um, also people ask for a lot of input. So a lot of what I do is look at documents or presentations and provide comments. I'll, I'll take, I'll read through something and say, ah, yeah, like, why don't we do this differently? Oftentimes I'll also uh, put in references to research. So, you know, especially as you think about a topic and I'll use a different, I won't use, since I work at Google now, I'll use a different company. Um, when you're a user experience professional, success looks like being brought into the strategic planning process or the algorithm design process. Like you build the trust to then have input into those processes. And when you do that, your typical day looks like meeting with a core team, writing or reviewing a document or a presentation, and then perhaps sharing that insight or a set of insights or content with someone else. Um, that's uh, quite a bit of what you do. Um, and for me personally, I am further from the tools than I used to be, Michael. <laughs> I don't use Materialize or Angular or Python or Figma or any of it. Like I, a lot of my team members do um, and a lot of my colleagues do. Most of my tools are Google Docs, Google Slides, Gmail, and chat. And it's almost embarrassing to admit that because, yeah, <laughs> it's the life of a manager. Well, with that, thank you again, Alex, for a thought-provoking uh, presentation. Um, uh, could you uh, share the slides with me? Oh, sure. I'd be happy to. Great. And, um, and then, you know, we can share the slides with our audience. And um, as you all know, this event is being recorded, so the recording will be available online. Um, the talk was exciting, and it was also very scholarly. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for saying that. And again, thank you so much. Uh, it's great to see you, uh, Chen Zhao, after all this time. Uh, it's nice that we can still be colleagues together. It makes me so happy. And uh, yes, I hope that this was thought-provoking in ways that you didn't expect. Uh, so yes, thank you again for the opportunity. Here as well, it's wonderful. Um, thank you all for uh, coming tonight and um, I will see you around. Bye Alex. Take care, thanks everyone. <laughs>